you have an American night. Thank you. You're welcome. So how much of art did you know prior to this film? Um, uh, it depends on what, what type of art you want to know from, from Velasquez to William Turner, from William Turner to Pythagoras, from Pythagoras to Mark Rothko, Mark Rothko to Picasso, Picasso to Warhol, Warhol to fucking Damien Hirst, Chapman Brothers. Okay, I so you know more than the average. <laughs> <laughs> yeah sure oh, very knowledgeable yeah that's great i tried to paint my i tried to paint myself I, it, instead of an actor i would much rather have been a painter because then i wouldn't have to see anyone i wouldn't have to talk to anyone i would just have to be there and do the fucking paintings myself and then send them off to some exhibition somewhere um it would be the perfect job for me but i am the worst painter i have ever seen well, uh, it's dreadful. It's dreadful. It's it's so bad. Even friends of mine who are supposed to be friends of mine kind of go, Johnny, you play music and you play the flute and you act, but you fucking can't paint for shit. You know what? I'm maybe on the next lifetime. Yeah, it's funny. It's my wife, Mara, who plays Asia in the film. Uh, so I, I kind of do these sort of like abstract paintings and stuff like that. And I say, hey, what do you think of this? And what do you think of that? And she said, oh, I'm going to do a painting. And she did a perfect landscape first time. Natural. And I said, how did you do it? And she goes, fucking, what's that guy, Bob? Who was the guy? Yes, I know who you're talking about. He used to sort of like do these. Netflix his, right now. His lovely little squirrel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So let's talk about the film. So yes. what was it? Um, that sold you because Alicia wrote it, directed, but what was it about the script that sold you to want to be a part of it? Um, well, you see, the script is always like a template for what you're going to do. And whenever an actor reads a script, they have an imagination of what it's going to be like. No scene ever looks like you imagined it because it's not in my head, it's in the director's head. Mm -hmm. uh, what I liked about John Kaplan is uh, he's, uh, he's under pressure the whole time. He's flawed. Um, he does the right things for the wrong reason and the wrong things for the right reason. He never seems to quite get it right. Um, but then, of course, he's, he didn't start in the, in the art world as, start, as such because he's a forger. He started in the criminal world. Um, what most people don't know, and they probably do now, and certainly you're going to find out, is that when very, very wealthy people and very wealthy corporations buy great pieces of art, 40, 50 million dollars pieces of art, you know, uh, they buy a Van Gogh or they buy a William Turner if it's available or a Whistler or whatever it is, or a Sargent, and they immediately get an excellent forger to forge an exact copy of it. So they can put it in the office or they can put it in their homes or they can put it in the entrance to their corporate building. Because you're not going to put a $60 million photograph in the entrance to your corporate building or in your house, just in case you have a house party with some sort of like more exuberant guests and some fucking billionaire throws a, a glass of fucking Margot 54 all over your Van Gogh, which would be disaster. So the, the real paintings are usually kept in vaults of very, very private rooms. So for private viewing. Um, which makes an awful lot of sense. <laughs> you know? Now, exactly. Now, Alessio, tell us, how did you know Jonathan was the perfect one to play John? I was cheap. <laughs> He's one of the most talented actors that have ever lived, so the answer is very easy. And I was cheap. <laughs> it's funny it's okay it, it, it's like you know it's like the I, I funnily today i was watching an interview between a professor and um and daniel day lewis and daniel day lewis before he made a, my left foot was actually in an empty house in west london where he was kind of like the caretaker and nothing was happening for him he wasn't getting any work he, he wasn't doing anything and this script arrived through the door and he, uh, he, he looked at it and the first thing he saw was a foot. And so he was like, he devoured the script very, very quickly. And then he rung the producer, Noel Pearson. And the Noel Pearson said, well, we want to make this film. We have no money, no director. 
how do you feel about it? <laughs> so, you know, the nice thing about working on limited budgets is you don't have, you know, uh, you don't have the sort of like the insidiousness of the studio breathing down your neck. You get to work with the people that you're working with. It's not like a, this three ring circus of $250 million and four different crews all doing different things. Um, uh, it's very, very different to the sort of like Mission Impossible. And the Mission Impossible, you never knew what you were shooting at any point in time. There's 18 cameras all around. You never know which one's on you. It, it's, a, it's not exactly an artistic process. It's more like a commercial, um, uh, it's like a, a commercial chore. Uh, doing a film like this, um, what attracted me to it was that uh, I like the actors in it. I was also a very, very big fan of Emil Hirsch and Las Vega. Um, and uh, John Kaplan is um, is a character that I haven't been sort of like asked to play in, uh, before. I've asked been, been asked to play anti heroes, but but never sort of that type of anti hero who has to become so many different aspects, so many different people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, it was great. It was. It's like a. It's like a. It's a, a mafia story. It's a crime story. But to be a good criminal, you have to be an excellent artist. It is like a mafia story because art brings a lot of greed. Yeah, of course, people are greedy. But it's like if you're in the criminal world and you want to steal art, like Martin Cahill in the 1990s in Ireland uh, raided a house in Kildare and stole very many paintings. One of those paintings was Vermeer. The problem is, you can't fucking shift the Vermeer. There's only so many of them in the world. There's only two in private ownerships, and the rest are in, are in our museums. So who do you sell it to? So you have to have an incredible network of people already set up to get this thing done. So what you do is you take the painting, the Vermeer, then you have somebody make an absolute forgery of it. Then you try to sell the forgery. The forgery will be seen as inauthentic and dismissed. While that forgery is being dismissed, their eyes are on the forgery, they're not on the realistic painting, which can be swept off into the Middle East somewhere where somebody can actually afford it for $500 million or whatever they're gonna pay, um, and never to be seen again. Mm -hmm. That's well, how it's done. You opened the topic, and I asked Alessio this earlier, but now it'll be on record. Do you guys think the last Leonardo that was found is a da Vinci? Talking uh, about yeah, art. So, well, no, it was started by Da Vinci and it was something that Da Vinci abandoned. And maybe some of his students added things to it or subtracted things to it. But yes, it certainly has the hallmarks of a, of a, a Da Vinci. But you see, sometimes art, artists paint over canvases that they've already painted on. It's a very common thing to do, you know, um, uh, depending on the material you can get at the time. Most artists of that time would have had their paints made from scratch. They didn't go in and they didn't buy a tube of Winston and you know put it down. They usually started with rock powder and they grind it themselves, and to get that perfect cobalt blue or to get that to, to get the 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 sort of like the turmeric mustard, it's a very very difficult thing to do uh, from a from a tube. You have to do it from the rock itself. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a very very complicated thing to do. Mm -hmm. Alessio, for the record now, can you answer again? Well, I, the answer is, is I have no clue. It does, it has elements of Da Vinci, but also it has elements that are not from him. And the truth is probably nobody, I mean, of course there are experts who, who have evaluated it and have studied it. But I, I guess I'm not expert enough to, to, to make a final uh, judgment on, on that. It certainly was valued a lot and put in an incredible museum. So I'm hey. sure people will keep talking about it for years. Let's real quick talk about one of the scenes. I, that was one of my favorite scenes aside of other scenes in the film. But what was it like for you, Alicia, to direct? And what was it like for you, Jonathan, to act in the creative love scene with paint. That was one of my favorites, maybe because I'm a girl and it just looked super classically done, very nicely done. Uh, well, Paz Vega is a very, very beautiful woman, so it makes it very, very easy to do that sort of thing. Uh, also, it's like 
um, what happens is instead of them being in the art world, they, they make the sexual connection, they become paintings. So the they art. immerse themselves in the art. They are art themselves. They, the art of making love. Um, and so it, so instead of sort of just looking at a painting, ima imagine being able to, um, to fall into Edward Munch's The Scream. Imagine being able to fall into Van Gogh's flowers on Van Gogh's stars. Um, or imagine being able to open that window in Vermeer's painting, the window, the, 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 the window closing. You see, if you look at that painting, it's a painting, a very, very famous painting. It's a street painting of that Vermeer did. But the window is in the wrong place. You couldn't open a window like that. But it was the only way to make a composition work. So you can imagine yourself falling into a painting like that. So I think this is what they were doing, is that they were, they were falling into the world that they loved and um, true the love they had for each other. Mm -hmm. um, and the payoff is woo -woo. <laughs> very elegantly done. Alicia, what do you have to say? Well, uh, Johnny summed it up really well. Uh, my goal was always to create a very poetic, tender, uh, sweet love making scene that was about true love and true human connection uh, between characters. And it was also about having them physically immerse, as just beautiful, Jonathan just beautifully said, have them to be physically immersed in, in, in the art, in the paint, and have them become art and merge with art. Well, thank you so much for your time both. Congratulations. This film is out today and theater is an on demand. So right after this, I have to get on it and get it online so people can watch this interview. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry for so much trouble with the with the tech thing, but I was born way, way back in the 20th century, um, <laughs> you know, where they had wars and guns and such like that. Um, no I worries, was, uh, it happens. You know, when I started making film, we actually used film. When I started making film, when we did continuity shots, they were done on Polaroid. I hate being old. I, I, I remember <laughs> Polaroids. I'm not that young. I may Is look that, like oh, it, but I'm not. Yeah, I mean, you look, yeah, are you a millennial? I'm an 80s kid. I was born, born in 81. I'm 40, so. Okay, so I was born in 77. And oh, right, right it, around there. Yeah, in the middle of sort of, I was born into the middle of a, a country at war, so uh, it was a, a very, very different place to be. We didn't have a telephone in our house until I was 13 years old. And every time the telephone went off, my grandmother almost had a fucking heart attack because she thought it was like some sort of robot. Oh. Um, it, was, it was so archaic. My grandfather was a barrel carrier for a, a brewery and he used to carry the, he used to bring the barrels around on a horse and cart. Wow. Oh, wow. Maybe. Uh, but, but then of course it's Ireland. We were 50 years behind the rest of the world. We're now only 48 years behind the rest of the world. Well, I hope technology is making it easier for you. <laughs> thank you very much. Listen, thank you for your time, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. You guys have a good day and congratulations. Thank you, thank you. very much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. You. Ciao.